by this book, George Mitchell, The Negotiator. Uh, he's a man of many titles, uh, judge, senator, ambassador. Uh, I think the best one is peacemaker. Uh, as you may know, uh, you have the information in your uh, bulletin, uh, but uh, we just finished reading The Orphan Train, one book, one Philadelphia. And you will learn in this book that his father was an orphan, and at four years old from an orphanage in Boston, uh, he, along with other orphans, were taken to Maine, lined up outside the church, and a Lebanese family uh, adopted his father. So there's the link. It wasn't just the trains going out to the Midwest, but orphans were being lined up and adopted uh, in Maine and other places as well. His mother came here when she was 18 from Lebanon, did not speak any English, could not read any English, uh, but she made a life. She met his father, who had been adopted by this Lebanese family, and together, uh, with that background, his father was a janitor at Colby College, they, their son rose to the prominence uh, and to the contributions that he has made. A couple other quick insights you might be interested in. One is that he's just stepped down from being the Penn State Independent Ethical Monitor, a position that was created in the wake of Penn State's agreement with the NCAA. A second insight is that he was chair of the board of Walt Disney when Philadelphia's Comcast made an unwelcome bid to take over Walt Disney. And of course, there were interesting things about that. And then the last thing I want to say about him is I find it remarkable. He turned down a chance to be on the Supreme Court in order to work on health care legislation uh, when President Clinton was in office. He also, after that, leaving uh, the Senate and going into private, turned down the opportunity to be the president of Walt Disney. But they were so uh, anxious to have him involved in the company that they invited him to join the board, and he ultimately, as you know, became the chair of Walt Disney. He's going to be interviewed tonight by one of... Uh, Philadelphia's leading uh, newscasters and a woman with great ability to pr provide skillful interrogation, uh, Tamela Edwards. And so please join me in welcoming the peacemaker, George Mitchell. Good evening and welcome. I was lucky enough to get to have dinner with the senator. He's got great stories. I told him I had 20 questions. He said, well, my answers are long. You might get in six. So we'll see what we do before it's your turn. The book is a great mix of where you came from and many of the things that you've done. And a lot of it is fascinating because I, I didn't know the extent to, as people like to say, we were poor, but we didn't know it. There was a lot of love. There was a lot of happiness. But you grew up exceptionally poor in a hard scrabble background. And you tell a story about going to college. Your father pushed you through. You graduated at 16. And you go to see somebody about getting into college. And he, you say, you know, we don't have a lot of money. And he says, I'll take care of it. But you go to see your high school principal. And he says, that's not the place for a person like you. He could have crushed your dreams in that moment. And when you look at kids struggling today and you think about how things can turn on a knife, what comes back to you? Mm -hmm. Well, first, uh, I want to thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Uh, if I were in the audience, I'd come to hear you, no matter who's <laughs> sitting here. Uh, and I want to thank Morris very much for that really generous uh, introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, as you might expect, I speak several times a day. I've heard myself talk so often that, for me, the highlight of the program is the introduction. <laughs> and uh, uh, I enjoyed it very much, Morris, and I thank you. Uh, there's a risk, however, uh, if you speak often and get these very generous introductions, that you might start to believe some of the things that are said. 
So I'd like to begin, if you don't mind, with yes. a brief story uh, about introductions and how I was on one occasion brought back down to earth. Uh, I chaired three separate sets of negotiations in Northern Ireland over a span of five years. And when I finished, I came back home and wrote a book about my experience and uh, then made the same kind of tour I'm on now, promoting sales of the book. In the course of it, I received many, many introductions, far more than I could possibly uh, accept. But I learned an interesting fact that in the United States, there are more Irish American organizations than there are Irish Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they all invited me. I couldn't go to all of them, but I went to many. And as I traveled around the country speaking to these Irish American groups, uh, for which I felt an affinity because my father's parents had been born in Ireland. He didn't know anything about his Irish background because he was an orphan, but I'd had the chance to go there and learn something about his background. So as I traveled around, uh, they developed among these groups uh, a competition as to who could give the longest, most fantastic, often ridiculous introductions. The, the proper reaction, of course, would have been for me to show some humility, uh, to encourage them to keep it short, cut down. I, I had an improper reaction. I loved it. I, I encouraged them. I scolded them when they left something out. One guy spent 35 minutes detailing every incident in my life, including many with which I had not previously been familiar. <laughs> And when he finished, I get up and I criticized him for leaving out the fact that I got the science award my junior year in high school uh, <laughs> back in Maine. So by the time I got to the last stop, which was the Stamford, Connecticut Irish American Club, I was very impressed with myself, had a hard time squeezing my head through the front door. But when I get in, the first person I encountered was an elderly woman who rushed over to me, very excited, shook my hand vigorously, and said with great emotion. I'm, I'm so thrilled to meet you. She said, you're such a great man. You've done so many great things all over the world. She said, I don't live anywhere near here. I drove three and a half hours just to come here to say that to you, to shake your hand and ask you, please, would you sign my poster? She handed me a poster and a pen. I took it and I said to her, I'm happy to sign your poster, but before I do, I think there's something I should tell you. She said, what is it? I said, I'm not Henry Kissinger. <laughs> It was a <clears throat> picture of Kissinger. She said, you're not? She said, well, who are you anyway? <clears throat> when I told her, she got very agitated and upset. She said, that's terrible. She said, I drove three and a half hours to meet a great man named Kissinger, and all I've got is a nobody like you. <clears throat> I said, well, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do to make you feel better. And uh, she thought for a moment, she said, well, there is. I said, what is it? And she leaned forward and I leaned forward like in a conspiratorial way. And she said in a low voice, nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> she said, would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name <laughs> to my portrait? <laughs> so I did. And there it's hanging today on the living room wall in Eastern Connecticut, a daily reminder to me not to believe these wonderful things that are said. But now, let me add a postscript, which is really, to me, the best part of the story. About a year ago, Kissinger and I appeared together uh, at a conference in Manhattan in one of these high-rise private clubs. And uh, just like this, the moderator and the two of us, and we got questions about the Middle East and China and Iran and so forth. I told this story. I thought it'd be a good occasion to tell it. The crowd loved it. He laughed. On the way out after the program, we found ourselves on the elevator together, coming down to the ground floor. And he said to me, I've heard you speak often. I've been on a program with you many times. He said, I've never heard you speak better than you did tonight. I said, really? I said, was it my answer on China? The Middle East? No, 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 he said, it was that story you told in the beginning. <laughs> he said, that's really a great story. You should tell that all over America. <laughs> and I do, and I keep a list. 
So the Philadelphia Free Library is on the list, and every time I see my hand of the list, I say, yeah, I'm spreading the word. Here it is. Here it goes. So anyway, thank you, Morris, for not only for making this program possible, but for the generous introduction. Thank you for the story. And we'll go back to the question, which is... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, right. Questions. When you look at how <laughs> comfortable you are and so all the things that you've done, you know, people buy this book wondering about the traje trajectory. And when you start and you tell that story of being a 16-year-old kid who almost got derailed, I know you have a scholarship program for people, many of them first generation to go to college. How does that inform the choices you make today, the fact that somebody looked at you and for no good reason said, you don't belong there? Yeah. Well, my parents were poor. Uh, my mother couldn't read or write, spoke English with a very thick accent, and she spent 50 years working the night shift in textile mills. My father's parents were immigrants from Ireland, but he never knew them. He was raised in a Catholic orphanage in Boston and adopted later by an elderly couple. Uh, and uh, he left school after the third or fourth grade, about 10 years old, and worked his whole life as a laborer and in the last two decades as a janitor at a local college. But they had a dream, and their dream was that all of their children would go to college. As with many people in their circumstance, lacking totally in education, they had a profound belief even in some ways exaggerated in the value of education. My father was of the firm belief that if you graduated from college, you couldn't possibly fail in life. How, how could you with all this education? And that was their goal. And so they died penniless, but they had achieved their dream. Each of their five children graduated from college. Two of us received graduate degrees. And now we live lives that to my parents would have been completely unimaginable. It is in part, of course, large part due to their sacrifice, but also to the openness of our society. Uh, in America, nobody should be guaranteed success, but everyone should have a fair chance to succeed. And I said in the book that I had my chance, and this book describes it. One of the motivating factors, frankly, was my concern that in terms of upward mobility, uh, we are doing not better, but worse than in the past. I think the prospects for a young person in my circumstance having the chance that I had are less now than they were 70 years ago when I was a kid. Uh, and so I'm constantly asked about foreign affairs, and I'm happy to respond to questions about anything, but, but I feel that Influence in the world, economic might, military might, all really are grounded uh, in a well-educated, well-informed, and open society in which everyone can reach the maximum of their talent through education, through knowledge, through skill. And uh, I created a scholarship program. which We give out a scholarship to a graduate from every high school in Maine every year. Uh, it's based partially on need, but two-thirds of our students are the first of their family ever to go to college, and about one-fourth of them come from families with annual incomes of less than $20,000 a year. And I see in their eyes, I meet with all of them, I meet with all their families, I see in their eyes many mirror images of myself at their age. I was 16, I was insecure, uh, uncertain, naive, uh, and I might have turned away at the words of my principal. But I decided as an act of rebellion against a lot of things, most of which doesn't make sense now and I don't think made sense then, but that's the way I thought that I would go, although I was very much afraid that uh, I would not succeed, that I would fail and not make it. And that's another thing I want young people to know is that not to fear failure. There's no human being who's ever done anything that hasn't failed at something in some aspect of life. And it's, it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, it should be, in fact, a spur to get up and try harder the next time. 
I read a story recently about first-generation students, first to go to college, banding together at universities like Harvard and Yale because they have this little voice in their head that says, you don't belong here, you're not good enough. Yeah. You've done some amazing things. You've met queens, presidents, yeah. negotiated things. At what point did the change happen for you, and what was it where you felt like, I belong in this room, it's perfectly fine? I don't think there was any uh, one occasion. Uh, first was when I actually went to Bowdoin College and didn't get kicked out or flunk. Uh, I actually passed and graduated, much to my surprise. Uh, and then uh, I had the very great honor, and I mean those words sincerely, of serving in the United States Army. It was for me one of the great opportunities of my life. I thought serious about making it a career because I loved the Army. Uh, there was discipline, there was a reinforcement of the values of patriotism, cooperation, coordination, selflessness. All of, all of them, I think, good high qualities. And I, while many who served didn't have good experiences, uh, for me it was one of the great uh, formative experiences of my life. And, and it was the first time that anybody ever asked me to lead anything, to do anything that had a, a leadership uh, connotation. And uh, while I was uneasy at first, I became more comfortable with it. And so I think, although there was no one turning point, I, I think it probably was graduating from Bowdoin and then uh, uh, serving in the Army. Although I have to say, winning a statewide election isn't bad either for reaffirmation. <laughs> you know, there's an interesting, you know, a lot of people will say, I am who I am. But in the book, you raise the question, are you are who you are, or you are who you tell yourself you are? And you've got two instances, one with sports, you know, you were the runt brother with right. a bunch of superstars. Right. But you have a moment in college where you finally let yourself off the hook trying to compete with their record. And you have other moments as well. One is fundraising, where you're just like, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Mm -hmm. And then you have a come to Jesus moment. Either I'm going to learn to love it, or that's well, it. Done. What did you learn about you are who you say you are, or versus who you tell yourself yeah. you are? Yeah. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do, even though you don't like to do it. And I learned that about fundraising uh, in the Senate. Uh, I was initially appointed to the Senate to complete an unexpired term by Senator Muskie, who was appointed Secretary of State. And uh, after I'd been there for a while, the public opinion polls uh, were published. Uh, one congressman announced he was going to run against me, and he published a poll that showed him beating me by 36 percentage points. That prompted the other congressman to release a poll which showed that she would defeat me by 33 percentage points, and that prompted a former Democratic governor to announce that, based on the two Republican polls, I was such a weak candidate that I couldn't possibly win, so he should be nominated, and he, he published a poll that showed I would lose to him in a primary by 25 percentage points. So you talk about bleak prospects <laughs> and trying to raise money in that environment. Uh, it was very, very difficult. But the, the final epiphany came, and I describe it in the book. I, I did two fundraising events on successive weekends uh, in my election campaign, uh, which made me realize I had to do better. It, and they were as different as you could have. One was on a farm in a rural part of Maine, and a young couple, young farmers, really very nice. They liked me, I liked them. And they said, now, we don't think we can get a big crowd or raise much money, but would you come? And I said, yes. And they were right on both counts. There, <laughs> there were about six people there. <laughs> and the only two people who contributed were the couple themselves. Uh, and then I thought, well, that, you know, that happens. Next weekend, I'm going to Los Angeles. Beverly Hills, the land of big bucks. And I said, we'll more than make up for it there. A friend of Senator Muskie's had reluctantly agreed to host a fundraising brunch for me in Beverly Hills the following weekend. Scheduled for 11 o'clock Sunday morning, 1045, the phone rings in my hotel room. He said, I'll be right up. I want to talk to you. I said, well, no, no, you don't have to come up here. I'll come down there, and we'll go to the fundraiser. No, no, he said, I have to come up and talk to you. That was a warning sign. He came up. He said, I'm sorry to tell you that I sent out 145 written invitations, and I did not get a single acceptance. 
He said there's no fundraiser because not a single person will come. He said, however, my wife and I want to give you this check to pay for your airfare. Well, <laughs> I thanked him very much. That was very nice of him. Some other conversation ensued. But on the flight back from uh, Los Angeles to Washington, I had spent two days flying out and back for the price of the air tickets. Uh, I resolved that uh, I don't like this, I don't enjoy doing it, but I can't have the Senate seat without doing the painful work that's necessary to raise money to enable to get there. It may not be right, it may not be fair, et cetera, et cetera, but that's what it is. So I began to learn to ask complete strangers for money, which was very hard at first, but Eventually it worked out and I was lucky to come back and win the election and then went on to become Senate Majority Leader where I did fundraising five nights a week. In the book you talk about patience, listening, the various things that you have to have to be a negotiator, but in the first part of the book, a lot of it's informed by your family. There are four boys and a girl, you're the youngest of four. Yeah. Yeah. You talk a lot about your relationship with your brother Robbie, who at one point gets all these jobs, has you do the work while he sits on the phone with his girlfriend. You finally figure it out and he, he can, you confront him. And he says, George, I'm management and you're labor. Management <laughs> always makes more money. That's right. That's right. And I wondered what of being the younger brother came to play in all those later days? How did it inform you as a leader? Well, we have a very close-knit family. Uh, we still do. I see my brothers and sister often. Uh, but my three older brothers were great athletes. I was not. I was not as good as my brothers. In fact, I was not as good as anybody else's brother. <laughs> so I began very early in life to have an inferiority complex. And I actually became known around our small town as Johnny Mitchell's kid brother, the one who isn't any good. <laughs> so, of course, I became very competitive toward them. I, my brother Robbie, who has since passed away, was really a great guy. We all worked. One of the ethics that our parents taught us from literally the time we could walk was you have to work. So we all had several jobs, and my brother was a brilliant entrepreneur in high school, in junior high school. And we used to play at the local boys club, and one day he approached me. He said, I've gotten the concession to do the janitorial work at the boys club. He said, and if you will help me, I'll split the fee with you. I said, that's great, another source of income. I already delivered papers, washed cars, did various jobs. So the first night, he went into the director's office, called his girlfriend and talked for an hour and a half while I swept all the floors, I cleaned, and what I really hated, I had to clean all the latrines in the bathroom in the boys' club. At the end of the week, he paid me $2.50. I thought, that's great. About a month later, he told me that he'd gotten a concession for a small office building next to the boys' club, and we could do the same deal. I said, I couldn't believe my good fortune. <laughs> now I was earning $5 a night cleaning the boys' club and this uh, local office building. A couple of months later, so $5, I, I learned by accident that he was getting $15 per building. So he was keeping $25 a week, and I was getting $5, and I was doing all the work. And it struck me as somehow, that's not right. So I confronted him. And he said to me, well, he said, I got the concession. He said, if I had not got the concession, there would be no job. So you wouldn't have a job. You wouldn't have your $5 a week. So he said, look, you've got to understand, I'm management, you're labor. And management always gets paid more. And then he said, yes, I said, I split the money with you. But split doesn't necessarily mean 50-50. <laughs> he said 90-10 is a split. So what are you complaining about? And I said, well, gee, you're right. Thank you very much. And I went back <laughs> and did the job. But he was a great guy. We had many, many wonderful experiences. I do want to say one thing about my brothers in sports. Uh, my brother Johnny was a very famous basketball player in high school and college. He made all New England in college. Honorable mention All-American. He was really quite well known. When the governor of Maine called me, then I was a federal judge, and asked if I would agree to be appointed to the United States Senate, I said, Governor, I said, I, this is a big decision. I, I gotta call my family, I gotta think about it. He said, I'll give you one hour. It was late at night the day before he made the announcement. So I called my brothers. Now, this is a competitive 
situation. <laughs> and I called them ostensibly to seek their advice. But there was a note of triumphalism in my voice. <laughs> I said to them, the governor has just called. He wants to appoint me to the Senate. What do you guys think about that? Well, the reaction was very negative. My brother Johnny said, oh, you're a born loser. He said, you couldn't possibly <laughs> win a statewide election. You better say no. After they gave me a hard time for about 10 minutes, I called the governor. I said, governor, I don't need an hour. I've already received all the reassurance I need <laughs> that I can handle this job. Fast forward two and a half years later, after being way behind in the polls, I won the election. And on election night, traditional hotel ballroom, cheering crowd, stage packed with people. And when I came out to give my acceptance speech, there was my brother Johnny. He pushed my wife and kids aside and got next to me and put his arm around me as I delivered the acceptance speech. The next day in the Portland Evening Express, a big picture on the front page of me with my brother draped over me, the famous one, and the caption said, Senator George Mitchell celebrating his upset election victory being cheered on by an unidentified supporter. <laughs> and to this day, that was the highlight of my life. <laughs> The little brother wins. So you have fabulous experiences through life. You get asked to do a lot of things. Some you do, some you don't. One you turned down that left my mouth open, being nominated to the Supreme Court. And you said, no, I'm sure you get asked all the time, why and to this day do you feel good about that decision? Yeah. In, uh, I, I was scheduled for re-election in the fall of 1994 uh, and in January, February of that year, I decided that I would not seek re-election. Uh, I'd made that decision a long time before to self-limit myself, and I thought it's always a good idea for guests to leave when people are asking you to stay rather than waiting till you know they want you to go. That's the way I felt toward the main electorate. Uh, and so I announced that I was not going to seek re-election. Uh, uh, just a month later, uh, Justice Harry Blackman of the Supreme Court announced that he was going to leave the court and President Clinton called me and said I would like to nominate you to replace Justice Blackman on the Supreme Court. And I was extremely flattered. I, I, my goal in life was to practice law in a small town in Maine and I eventually became a federal judge and now of course the Supreme Court is the pinnacle for any lawyer. But we were then engaged in the struggle uh, to extend health care. Uh, to all Americans, uh, a struggle which, of course, ultimately failed uh, uh, during the Clinton administration. But at that time, I had been working closely with a Republican senator, John Chafee of Rhode Island, a wonderful guy, a very close friend of mine, and we worked closely across the aisle on a lot of issues. And I thought we had a chance to merge the administration's bill, which I had introduced the previous November, and a Republican bill which Senator Chafee had authored and which had about 20 Republican senators on it. Uh, ironically, I'll digress for a moment how, how things change in American politics. The President's bill called for an employer mandate, except for small businesses with less than 50 employees. Employers would be required to provide health insurance to their employees. The Republicans were adamantly opposed to that. So they had a series of think tank sessions and they came up with an alternative of the individual mandate in which the individual would be required to buy health insurance. So as Chafee and I were talking, I thought if we could get them to move our way and as a gesture to them, if we could give up on the employer mandate and accept their proposal for an individual mandate, maybe we can get a bill a bipartisan bill. I was wrong uh, through no fault of Chafee's, who was a great guy. We didn't not only come together, we really moved further apart and the bill ended up not moving anywhere uh, and was abandoned in August of that year. Now, of course, fast forward 25 years, Obama puts the individual mandate in the bill and it's a reason why it was opposed. It's funny how the parties 
circle around each other over time and switch positions regularly depending upon the circumstances that exist. We see that now on the trade. The, the Republicans once were the party of protection and Democrats were the party of trade. Now it's completely reversed itself and we've seen it of course most dramatically on the issue of race in our nation's history, how the parties have almost entirely 180 degrees reversed their earlier positions. But at that time, I thought Chafee was a little more skeptical than I was. I have to acknowledge that. Maybe I was engaged, indeed I was retrospectively engaged in wishful thinking, but I thought we might have a chance for this bill. So I said to Clinton, I said, look, you can get plenty of good lawyers to go on the court. And he did. He got Steve Breyer, who is a terrific justice. Uh, but I'm the majority leader. I'm the sponsor of the health care bill. If I leave now, what little chance we got is gone. And so, really, I should stay and fight for health care. It didn't work out, but, you know, that's the way it is in life. You make the best decision you can based on the circumstances which exist, and if it doesn't work out, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and you move on. Well, that ties into the next thing I wanted to ask you. In the book, you lay out, you win some, you lose some. You win Northern Ireland, you lose on the Middle East, and many people will say we learn more in failure than we yeah. do when things go right. As a negotiator and as a person, what have you learned the most out of the things that didn't work? Well, I guess the principal lesson I learned in Northern Ireland is that in, in mediating conflicts, you know, this, I, I do private mediation, some two companies disagree over money, but that's a different issue. When you're mediating these historic conflicts, they, the people who live and work there, have to own the process and own the result. They can't, it cannot be forced upon them externally. The first day of the Northern Ireland negotiations, I said to the delegates, I do not bring with me an American plan, which I'm going to try to force on you. There's no Clinton plan. There's no Mitchell plan. Any agreement, if we ever do get one, will be your agreement. And two years later, when I drafted the agreement, I was keenly aware of that, and I made certain that every single word in the Good Friday Agreement was written or spoken by someone from Northern Ireland. It wasn't my decision. Now, I confess, I had a major decision in deciding which of the millions of words would go into the agreement and which would not, and that was a judgment. But everything was theirs. And they were ready primarily because they feared the alternative of a return to conflict. The history of warfare, of course, is that we don't like to think of this, but technology advances most rapidly in human affairs in the ability of humans to kill each other. And each conflict is more devastating than the one before because newer and more destructive and more killing weapons are available. And they feared it. I feared it, we all feared it, that if there were another outbreak in Northern Ireland, it would have horrific results. So they made a painful political choice. And these were ordinary men and women, just like us here in this room, who, who had the courage to rise to the occasion in extremely dangerous circumstances, to them personally, to their families, to their careers. Several of them had their careers ended. Two of them were assassinated during the talks. Several of them left, and it's a very difficult thing. In the Middle East, they haven't quite reached that stage. There's still not only no trust, there's active mistrust between the two societies, Israelis and Palestinians, and the leaders of those two societies. But the time will come, I believe, that they will recognize that the risks of entering into an agreement are less than the risks of not entering into an agreement. The alternatives for both sides, I think, are going to be possibly devastating, particularly with the Middle East in the tremendous turmoil that exists now with so many intersecting, overlapping, often contradictory conflicts. An eruption could occur at any time that could engulf everybody. And, and so I think that uh, they will come to recognize it, although they have not yet. Two quick ones before we talk about your mom. You want to end on your mom, and then the audience will get in. What do you do when people don't want to negotiate? And I'm thinking of ISIS, 
Boko Haram, Al Qaeda, what do you do? Well, keep in mind that uh, Islam is now in its 1400th year. It is undergoing uh, tremendous turmoil and conflict, much as Christianity did uh, at a comparable point in its history. That doesn't justify or rationalize the horrific things that are occurring. It places it in an historical conflict. The, what, what ISIS now represents is, a, is an, a nihilistic and evil uh, approach which seeks to impose on all of all Muslims Islam as it was practiced during the life of the Prophet Muhammad, which was, of course, 1,400 years ago. Thus, the emphasis on beheadings, on crucifixions, the acceptance of slavery, all of which were common at that time, not just within Islam, but outside. Now, it's a vision that seeks to turn the clock back 1,400 years that can't possibly succeed or be accepted. ISIS has been successful only in two narrowly defined geographic areas, in northern Iraq and northern Syria. And what is unique about those two places is that they are Sunni dominated. The populations are predominantly Sunni within countries that are controlled by the Shia. So it's a manifestation of the Sunni-Shia conflict. Keep in mind that it is, that is not a religious conflict. The Sunni-Shia divide occurred upon the death of the Prophet Muhammad when two competing groups fought to gain control of the dynasty that he had created. And they became the Sunnis, the winners, and the Shia, the losers. About 80% of Muslims today are Sunni, about 20% Shia. And for most of that history, Shia have been oppressed now the tables are turned in those two countries, and the Shia governments are seen as imposed, particularly in Iraq, by the outsiders, in this case, the United States. Those circumstances don't exist many other places in the world, so their geographic control is fairly limited, and I believe will be ended fairly soon. We can defeat ISIS militarily. Of that, there can be no doubt. No American fears an ISIS invasion of the United States. The problem is to deal with the sentiment which gives rise to the actions. It follows al-Qaeda, which follows al-Nusra, which follows the Brotherhood, which follows others. It, and it's a product in part of religion but also in part of economic and political circumstances. The Arab world has, was governed by Turks in the Ottoman Empire for 425 years. Then the British and the French came in, drew boundaries that bore no relationship to the tribal or ethnic nature of those living within them, but suited the interests of the British and the French. That's collapsing now, and a period of turmoil and tumult will follow and intensify what is now occurring, which we think is extraordinary, will be the norm. And keep this fact in mind. Today, of the seven and a half billion people in the world, one in five is Muslim, about a billion and a half. When the world's population edges above nine and a half billion toward 10 billion in mid-century, approximately the year 2060, one in three will be Muslim, three and a half billion which was the total population of the world as recently as 1970. Now, we should not be impatient and say, "How? why don't they sort it out? Because in the Western world, it took a long time. In France, 50 years between the time of the revolution and the establishment of the constitutional monarchy. In Britain, 200 years of internal warfare. Significantly a large part over religion and part of it over political control. And keep in mind that throughout all of human history, people who seek power have used popular values like religion, national identity, as a lever to gain power. Every leader 
seeks to identify the national interest with his interest. If you, if you don't do what I like, you're un-American or you're un-German or you're un-French or you're other something. This is going to go on for a long while. We should be encouraging, supporting those who share democratic values. We should be trying to help them put down democratic roots. Most of all, we should do what we can to encourage responsive governments that meet the needs of their people, uncorrupt. One of the huge appeals of all of these Islamic groups is purity in religion and non-corruption in politics. And that has a powerful appeal among people who have been subject to corrupt rule for a very long period of time. Not an easy task and a, and a hard line for us to thread, but I think we should do it. I think we have to be very, very careful where we engage militarily. I said this on a television show yesterday. The United States cannot bomb its way to success in the Middle East. We, we will have to take military action in some places, but we've got to be very careful about it. You've gotten the call when issues seem deep and intractable, both within the country and outside of the country. And I think right now a lot of people look at Baltimore, and that feels very intractable. Yeah. The Justice Department is opening an investigation, but we wonder if it's beyond the government that they need an independent panel, the kind that you have often been a part of. Would you answer that call? And do you think it might be the right move to look at the vertical, horizontal, deep-seated issues there and around the country? Oh, oh. I, I grew up believing that we are all so lucky to be Americans that anybody who is asked to serve his or her country in whatever form by the president or for some other good cause should do so. So I would unhesitatingly do if I were asked to do that by the president. Not that I have any answer to the issue. I want to complete the thought I started earlier. The conflict in Northern Ireland, in the Middle East, I also served some in the Balkans, are not exclusively or even primarily economic, as is the circumstance you describe in Baltimore. But underlying them all, in my judgment, is a huge economic component. Where people don't have opportunity, where they don't have hope, that's the fuel for instability. That's the fuel for people turning to violence. In, in, in the case you mentioned, and in our country, there is an additional racial element and the whole history of slavery and discrimination in our society. But to me, the answer, not the whole answer, but a necessary part of any answer is economic opportunity. See, I feel that when I started my scholarship program in Maine, I set as a goal that every single child in Maine, literally every one, would have the same chance I had to go to college and get an education. And nobody would be prevented from doing so because of lack of resources. Now, I know that's impossible to achieve in a mathematical sense. But think if every American set that as his or her and our national goal, that every single child in our society would have the good care and medical science is telling us, has told us, that what happens in the earliest weeks and months of a human's life has a profound impact on their ultimate development. Good care, good nutrition, good early stimulation, and then hope, opportunity, a chance to do something. I mentioned about Muslims earlier. I've traveled to almost every Muslim country in the world, and the, the vast majority of people I meet, and I believe it's the majority of People everywhere in the Muslim world want the same things we want, a job, a home, good care, and most importantly, to get their kids off to a good start in life. Now, some are evil, some are criminal, just as there are evil and criminal in our own society. But that ought to be the objective. I emphasize, I don't purport to know the answer to Baltimore specifically or to any others, but I do not believe that any answer that does not include a substantial component of education, of care and opportunity and education is probably not going to succeed. I know you wanted to end, you dedicate the book to your mother and you wanted to read some about her. Yeah. You tell some great stories about her and she grew up in Lebanon and every now and then a bit of Arabic would pop through, like when she's beating your brother Robbie because he won't go to practice. Yeah. When you think of her, is there a particular 
Arabic word that pops out that just sits with you. What does it mean, and why does it pop out? And will you please read that section yeah, about your yeah, mom? I need the uh, book. <clears throat> so I appeared uh, at an event like this in New York a week ago tonight, and I was introduced by Colin McCann, who is a very prominent Irish-American uh, writer. I've gotten to know him. He, he wrote a novel that included a f m me in it, and uh, uh, so to become friends. But he's really a well-established author. So as we walked up to the stage, just as you and I walked in, just before he introduced me, he said, well, what part of your book are you going to read? I said, well, I'm, I'm not going to read any part of my book. What are you talking about? I, he said, well, haven't you ever written a book before? I said, yeah, this is my fifth book. He said, well, real authors read from their books. <laughs> I said, really? And, you know, I, I, I said at the time, being introduced by Colin McCann at a literary event was like Babe Ruth introducing a little leaguer at a baseball event. So it was quite impressive. So I said, well, okay, if you've got to read to be a real author. And I did it, and so it kind of caught on. So I'd like to read the last, uh, last about page and a half of the book. Uh, it's, uh, it's about my parents, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book. Uh, on the hundreds of long flights to and from Ireland and the Middle East, I tried to imagine my mother's early life. What was it like for a young girl growing up in the hills of southern Lebanon? What was her parents' life like, Arabic-speaking Christians living in a Muslim-majority land? I asked the same questions about my father, who never knew his parents, and went from a Catholic orphanage in the center of Boston to the coal forests of northern Maine, where, as a boy, he worked among men. I wondered about his parents. Much has been written about Irish immigrants who succeeded in America, little about the many who failed. Their lives often were as hard and as barren as the huge rock formations of the west coast of Ireland. Had that been the fate of my grandparents and their parents? On a recent flight across the Atlantic, I saw the sun rising in Dublin as the plane touched down. I was drowsy, but my mind was awake with thoughts, dreams, and fantasies about those whose blood is now mine. And I thought of two stories, their familiar stories, of Ireland and Lebanon that always make me smile when they come to mind. I was at a reception in my honor at a resort hotel below the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. A bridge between them had been destroyed during the Troubles. It had been rebuilt, was now to be called the Peace Bridge, and named after me. The large and friendly crowd of well-wishers peppered me with questions about my father and his family. They reacted with surprise and disbelief when I answered that I really didn't know much about my father's history. To them, history is a living part of the present. Then a couple of them suggested that I retain them. They're in the business that specializes in genealogy, mostly for wealthy Irish Americans. With a twinkle in his eye and a smile on his face, the local official who was the host of the event said to me, Senator, if you pay them enough, they'll connect you to Brian Baru. <laughs> Brian Baru is an ancient warrior king, well known in Irish history sort of like George Washington in America. So we all laughed. In other words, it's all hokum. On the other hand, maybe it's not. The other story is about my mother. When we were growing up, she often said to her children, usually around the kitchen table, softly and with nostalgia, you should see Lebanon. It's so beautiful. The air is pure, the water clear, the mountains, the forests, even the flowers smell better. Oh, Lebanon, she would say, my Lebanon. But after arriving in the United States at the age of 18, she returned to Lebanon only once, very late in life, after my father died. My sister accompanied her, and they returned to the village where my mother grew up. They attended a reception and a dinner with relatives and friends in the house that she had been raised in. Late in the evening, after a lot of eating and drinking, my mother was asked to say something. According to my sister, my mother stood, paused, looked, at, looked out at the large happy crowd and said with great emotion and a huge smile, you should see America. <laughs> it, 
It's so beautiful. The air is pure. <laughs> the water clean. The mountains, the forest, even the flowers smell better. Oh, America, my America. She had little formal education. She couldn't read or write English and spoke it with a heavy accent. She worked her entire adult life on the night shift in a textile mill. But she was generous and loving, strong and wise, and she understood clearly the meaning of America. To me, no one has ever said it better. Oh, America, my America. Thank you all very much for having me. We can take questions from the side. Thank you. Thank you. And in each aisle, you'll see there's somebody with a microphone. If you have questions, please raise your hand. We'll try to get to as many as we can. I saw the lady in the beret, or gentleman in the beret. I'm sorry, it's dark from here. <laughs> They're both pretty tough customers. When uh, President Clinton came to Northern Ireland for the first time, I arranged for him to meet with Adams and Paisley on his first evening. And we flew overnight. I came with him. We flew overnight to London. We had a full day in London. He spoke to the parliament. We got the belt pass that night where everybody was exhausted. And we had meetings, first with Adams, 30 minutes scheduled for the meetings. So Adams came in. I introduced him to the president. The president said hello. Adams uh, launched into a 30-minute history of Northern Ireland through the eyes of a Republican. And it was detailed. It was powerful. It was emotional. It was persuasive. He then said goodbye and left. Clinton didn't say a word other than hello and goodbye. In comes Paisley. He launched into a 30-minute history of Northern Ireland as seen through the eyes of a unionist. Powerful, emotional, persuasive, but completely the opposite. Neither one of them acknowledged a single reason why the other side should have a grievance. It was all a description of the grievances against their community. There was not a glimmer of recognition that the other side might have a grievance too. And when we left to go to the hotel to go to bed, Clinton said to me, he said, you get your work cut out for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, you're right, it's going to be tough. Uh, they were both dominant political figures, both good orators, uh, both uh, deeply committed to their cause. And it is an amazing reality of history that in the end, not together and not simultaneously, because we never got them all together. Uh, another diversion. In the five years I was there, not once ever, never, did we get every party in the same room together. We were never able to accomplish that. Much of it was I talk to you and then I go across the street to talk to him and I go upstairs and downstairs. But they both finally agreed, different times under different circumstances, and the result uh, is history. So. I think, in a sense, uh, they accomplished much and uh, at least offset, if not vitiated, the prior difficulties of their history. The gentleman back there in blue. Uh, Senator Mitchell, my, my question is to George Mitchell, the judge, the a man who could have been a Supreme Court judge in the Supreme Court of the United States. So my question about the right of return in two groups of people. We have President Carter. We have, we have Bre my question to you about the right of return to two groups of people. Yeah. The first group of people, who, when President Carter was a president, he recruited lots of Muslim people and uh, to, 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 to fight the war in Afghanistan, those first wave of, 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 Mujah of Mujahideen, they were not really Mujahideen. They were highly paid mercenaries. They were paid very well. Somehow, 
the, those first web, they, they, they start recruiting people in the name of jihad. So, so in Egypt, for example, where I'm from, we have big problem. We, we, we call it the, the, the returnees from Afghanistan. So after people finish, so, so those people who when they came back to Egypt, they assassinated President Sadat, they made problem. So th those are the first group. Sir, unfortunately, he doesn't have second, a lot of time. Can group, you get the second to your group, question? Real quick, real quick. The second group of returnees is the, 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 the Palestinian refugees. When they, when they were forced, because of the war, forced out of uh, Palestine. And I can't get it all. You're going to explain it to me. They have I, I, sir, I, uh, neither one of us, I think, are following you. Can you boil this to a question? Yeah, yes, ma'am. The, the, the right of the Mujahideen, once they go to Afghanistan. Are you asking about the right of return in Israel and, and how it should be looked at? Yes. This, this, how would you answer that? What, what's the question? Uh, the issue, you raise it in the book. Um, after Israel is created, one of the things that you have to negotiate through with the various sides is what happens to the people who went to the camps? Do they have the right to come back? Right. And how you look at that issue? Right. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now let him let him go a little bit more. Senator Mitchell, the right of the Mujahideen to go to go back to the country where they came from, the right of the Mujahideen to go back to Egypt, the right of the Mujahideen to go back to Palestine, the right of the Mujahideen to go wherever they came okay, from. Okay, I think he's asking the right of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan who are from various countries. Do they have the right to return to various nations? that they come from? Can they go back to Egypt? Can they come back? Do you think they should have a right of return? The Palestinian right of return. The, if, if people have been a Mujahideen fighter in Afghanistan or elsewhere, should they have the right of return yes. back to their native countries? Yes, yes. Well, I think generally, of course, most people recognize a right of an individual to return to his country. The situation it, with respect to the Israelis and Palestinians is unique uh, in this respect, that following the, well, well first off, in 1947, the United Nations proposed a partition of the area to create two states, with Jerusalem being uh, an open city controlled by a UN-created commission or some independent entity. The Israelis accepted the UN proposal, the Arabs rejected it. And there began the first of several wars uh, and in that first, all of them won by an increasingly strong Israel. As during and after that first war, uh, several hundred thousand Palestinians either left voluntarily or were driven from their homes and settled, as you suggested, in primarily in camps in uh, Lebanon, Syria, and other places. And one of the issues in the negotiations is should they have the right to return to their homes, in particular if their homes are what is now Israel. Keep in mind so that you have a full picture balance, at the same time, many Jews were driven from Arab countries. So they are a lesser number uh, and they have not suffered the poverty and indignity that the Palestinian refugees have suffered, but it was not a one-way exodus of people. The right of return is one of the major issues between the two parties, along with the status of Jerusalem, borders, water, a whole host of other important issues. In the several negotiations that were uh, conducted between the parties, uh, the most specific that the parties got and the closest uh, was uh, were two during Camp David when President Clinton was office and then in what was called the Annapolis proceedings in the latter part of President George W. Bush's term. There, Pr President Abbas was negotiating with the then Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and they exchanged proposals on the right of return. Uh, and they almost came to agreement. The terms that they uh, uh, were discussing included a limited right of return for uh, specific numbers. They disputed the numbers, but they'd agreed on the principle that it would, be, it would not be everyone having the right of return, it would be limited in numbers. Implicit in their agreement, although it wasn't written in con conduct, con 
it wasn't written down at the time, but it was conducted by Americans, was that uh, there would be, as you know, on the boundary issue, an exchange of land. Some of the areas now in Israel that are close to the boundary line are densely populated, pop Israeli population centers. And it's very clear that no government of Israel, Israel will ever agree that they be outside Israel, so the border will be adjusted to include those territories within Israel. That will be compensated for by other land that is in Israel that is not developed to go to the Palestinians in an agreed land swap. And it is agreed that uh, adequate housing will be provided to Palestinian returnees who do not fall within the category that will be admitted into what is now Israel in those areas and others, funded largely, I think, anticipated by the United States. And so that's the compromise that Omert and Abbas worked out. Uh, many uh, on both sides oppose that. Many Palestinians feel, as you apparently do, that all Palestinians should have the unrestricted right of return to their homes wherever they are located. The, the reality is that's not likely to occur uh, and that no Israeli government will agree to it because, of course, it would transform Israel into a state in which Jews are in the minority. And I think that will not occur. So the question will be how many will be actually admitted and what will be provided for those who are not admitted in terms of housing, economic opportunity, and jobs. That's one of the issues being debated there now. Let's get some people on the side. I see two hands there. Do you believe that Turkey could be helpful in uh, these negotiations? Turkey? Uh, yes, it could, but it's not being very helpful right now. Uh, uh, the Turks are a very energetic, productive people. Of course, they completely dominated the region for, as I said earlier, 425 years. Uh, and they have the opportunity to play a very constructive role. Uh, but uh, in the last couple of years, uh, I think power has been greatly centralized, uh, and uh, uh, I think they could. Uh, I think they could play an important role. By complete coincidence, uh, I was in Northern Ireland two weeks ago uh, to to make a sort of a, a memorial lecture on the peace process, and I was asked to meet with a group of about. 15 Turkish leaders, a, a panel, a commission appointed by the government to study the Northern Ireland conflict with a view to a resolution of the conflict between Turkey and the PKK, the Kurdistan Independence Forces. And we talked for a great deal of time, and uh, I think the Turks could, in fact, play a very powerful and constructive role. They are helping in many ways uh, in terms of refugees. They are one of the largest recipients of refugees from Syria. Uh, uh, they, uh, they have done many good things and I think should be commended for it, but I don't think they have lived up to their full potential for a constructive role in uh, recent years. Most notably, they've, they, 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 in the Syrian crisis in particular, understandably from their perspective, they are focused almost entirely upon the removal of Assad and they don't put any emphasis on opposing ISIS or those regimes or those entities that uh, are creating so much problem elsewhere because they are opposed to Assad. It, it, it's very complicated. I apologize for the length of the answer, but uh, uh, that's my answer. They, they, they're a great country. They could be doing more. Okay, from the side, the person in the green shirt. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Uh, I wonder what your advice would be for uh, the next generation, uh, maybe a young man or young woman who is heading to college now. What are the biggest challenges that you see, and what advice would you have for what skills and knowledge they should be thinking about developing to, to address those challenges? The kids going to college now? Yeah. Well, I, I got married late in life, so I have a 17-year-old son, and we're doing college shopping now. Uh, 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 He's a great kid, and I hope he does well, but 
at least in my case, I, I really believe the best thing is to not to try to direct it, but to hope that he makes the right choices on his own. I think the important thing is not so much a fixed direction at this stage in life, but rather getting the intellectual and moral grounding that enables you to make the right choices a little bit later in life. Uh, and so my hope is he'll be happy whatever he does uh, and that he'll be a, a good and productive citizen. That's really the amount. And, and also, I know there are a lot of parents in the room. Frequently, if I want, if I want him to do, if I say do A, he'll do B. <clears throat> so I gotta be very careful with my advice. <clears throat> All right, it's time for the last question. Let's go to the lady right here. You talked about um, having a bipartisan relationship with Senator Chafee. Um, do you see any current negotiators in our current Congress, Senate, um, or House of Representatives that you think might be able to um, have the same kind of cooperation that you worked so closely with back in your day? I believe that most of the members of the Senate, are limited to the Senate, don't like the bind they find themselves in. Uh, increasingly partisan, decreasingly productive, much, much greater emphasis on money and fundraising. Uh, what I think is the corrupting part of the political process. I'm gonna digress and ask a question here that I ask all audiences, because it's tangentially related, and I'll come back to you in a moment. How many people here believe that your elected officials in Congress are more responsive to their constituents than they are to their donors? I've asked that question all over America to hundreds of audiences, in the aggregate, thousands of people, every cross-section of life, business groups, colleges, everything. In all that time, years, one person has raised her hand. And it was nine months ago or so in Washington when I spoke to a group, about, well, about double the size here, one woman raised her hand. And after the program was over, I went up to her and I said, I didn't want to embarrass you and I hope you're not embarrassed, but I have to tell you, you're the only person in America who's ever <laughs> raised a hand, so I feel compelled to ask you why. She said, it's very simple. My husband's a member of Congress. <laughs> now, in the Citizens United case, the Supreme Court said, it's not corruption large donations, not corruption. It's like an Alice in Wonderland story, completely divorced from the reality of American political life. History will judge the Citizens United decision as one of the worst decisions ever made by any Supreme Court in American history. Now, this is a literary audience. You're here in a library and you subscribe to a book program and I challenge every one of you to get a copy of that opinion and try to read it and try to understand it. It is impenetrable. <laughs> now, to be fair to the judges, they didn't create the problem. The problem has been there from the very beginning. In fact, you go out throughout human history, money and the capacity to organize have always been factors in political leadership, whatever the form of government, whatever the society. But it has reached a devastating point in our history. And what the Supreme Court did was nine guys taking a walk and they see a fire and they say, let's pour some gasoline on that fire. That's what the decision is, because it made it infinitely worse, not only the amounts, but it causes a reduction in transparency. Now, not only are people giving tens of millions of dollars, now we don't know who's giving what. It, it, and, and the corruption is not in a person saying, Senator, I'll give you $100,000 if you vote me. The corruption is what your answer was to my question. The bond of trust 
between the people of America and their elected officials so essential to a functioning democracy has been severed. There isn't an American who believes, other than the spouses of members of Congress, <laughs> that members are response to their elected officials. And isn't that what democracy is? Represented democracy is you get elected to represent people. The people don't believe they're being represented. And so the system, I think, is completely out of kilter because of the aspect of money. Now, I was at a dinner last week in Washington, and there were several senators there, and a, a guy from the cabinet. And I have to say I was very impressed by a woman senator who I'd not previously heard speak, uh, as Senator Amy Globuchar of uh, Minnesota. And she spent the whole discussion talking about the possibility of bipartisan cooperation in the Senate, contrary to the popular wisdom or public perception now. And she identified several areas that she and others are working on. And I said to, to one of the guys I was sitting next to, I said, I could see her someday being the first woman majority leader, because you need that kind of thinking in that position to try to bring, uh, bring people together. But look, this money thing is awful. When I was Senate Majority Leader, this is 20 years ago, I would get to my office before 7 o'clock every morning, and I would have waiting for me a dozen, 15, 20 telephone calls. Please don't have a vote at noon because I got a fundraising luncheon. Don't have a vote at 4 o'clock because I got a fundraising reception. Don't have a vote at 6 o'clock because I got a fundraising dinner. I went to an infinite number of those dinners. And one day I called a group of senators in. And to, I exaggerated to make a point. I took one of these big block calendars, you know, white with just the numbers on it. And I had it blown up big, like the size of that up there. And it was all colored except for a couple of slivers. And I said to them, if I do what all of you ask me to do, that is not have votes when you're engaged in fundraising, you can see the only time we can vote is between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on Thursday mornings. <laughs> that was an exaggeration. But the point was valid. It's, it, it's a mad, demeaning money chase. I, I, I mean, I don't want to sound partisan, but was there anything more embarrassing than to see these Republican candidates for president make a mission to Las Vegas to go and beg for money from one person, demeaning to them, demeaning to the office, demeaning to the, to the whole process. Uh, it's, it, I, I, I think it's unfortunate, and I think it's going to backfire on us. I think that's one of the hopes I have is that somehow we'll figure out a way to, to establish some limitations. Not, not, you can't stop it completely. That's for sure. But to establish some limitations, and especially to reverse the most recent trend, reducing transparency. I mean, we ought to be increasing transparency. At the very least, you have a right to know who's contributing to the campaigns of your elected officials in campaigns. And you don't know that now. You can't know it. Uh, so I, I, to me, that's one of the sad commentaries. I do hope that there will be a little bit of uh, uh, bipartisan cooperation this year because it's a good and healthy thing. There never was a time in American history, never ever, when it was all sweetness and light. Uh, people look back through rose-colored glasses and imagine once everybody loved everybody and they all got along. Uh, a professor at the University of Maine wrote an article about the presidential election of 1800. The candidates were now national historical icons, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And yet what they said about each other Oy, it would be terrible now. Of course, they didn't, have, they didn't have negative ads, and the words were read by only a few people, but it's always been rough and tumble. But now, with this money and with this ubiquitous television, people ask, why is Congress held in such low esteem? Well, I say, you're an ordinary citizen. You turn on the television. She and I are running against each other. I run an ad that says she's a crook, and she runs an ad that says, I'm a bum. Why would you believe anything other than that we're both crooks and bums? <laughs> Isn't that what political campaigns are about? In the 2012 nominating contest on the Republican side for president, the ratio of negative to positive ads was 35 to 1. 
And, and that's true on our side, too. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not making a partisan distinction there because that's what works. And it demeans everybody. And most of all, it demeans democracy. Thank you all very much. It's great to be here. Thank you, Senator. Thank you.